to today's second panel, the U.S. military's role in the rule of law, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, and peacetime presence from the trenches. I am Midshipman First Class Sloan Yates, and it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Dr. Doyle Hodges. Dr. Hodges is the executive editor of the Te Texas National Security Review, a joint partnership between War on the Rocks and the University of Texas. He's a graduate of the United States Naval Academy class of 1992, and his research includes civilian military relations ethics and international affairs, and grand strategy. Prior to joining the Texas National Security Review, he taught at the United States Naval, Academy, Naval War College and served as a visiting research fellow at the United States Naval Academy Stockdale Center for Ethics and Leadership. He earned his doctorate in 2018 from Princeton at the School of Public and International Affairs and his research interests focused on military legalism and the use of legal norms and reasoning to justify decisions for military officers. We are honored to have Dr. Hodges back with us today at the Naval Academy and moderating today's panel. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hodges this afternoon. Thank you very much, Sloan. That's uh, very kind of you. It's, uh, a real pleasure to be back on the yard. I, I never believed that when I was a midshipman and people would say that, but it's a wonderful day and a tremendous panel, and uh, I think we are blessed with some extraordinary panelists joining us today who we heard from Professor Call this morning sort of the theory. And then in the panel this morning, we heard the high-level application, and I think the hope this afternoon is to talk about what that looks like in the actual application of these questions, of how it is that military officers engage in the business of diplomacy, what the issues are, what the implications are as we do that, and the scope and diversity of activities that are involved in this is so broad that I thought perhaps the best way to introduce it was to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to give a brief vignette in which they describe something that they have done in their career combining the questions of military and diplomacy. And General Holland, if we can begin with you. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate the introduction. Um, sorry that I, I can't be there in person today. I'm, I'm actually talking to you from Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is the headquarters of the region that I command, the Mississippi Valley Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, but really great to join you on, on what is a very complex and certainly a timely topic, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So just by brief introduction, I, I am an Army engineer officer. I'm a graduate of West Point, uh, class of 1990. Uh, and of course, I currently serve in the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and I think it's important to just briefly touch on what the Army Corps of Engineers is. Uh, there's a lot of, not a lot of broad understanding of that, even within the Army, I would say. So, uh, you know, I guess I would think of it as America's federal engineering firm uh, that happens to be under the Department of the Army just because of the, of the history of where the Corps fit in in support of the, the birth of our nation and the development of our nation. Uh, it, so it is a Department of the Army entity. It is commanded by Army officers. Uh, and we lead 35,000 civilians, Department of the Army civilians and, and other related status, but mostly Department of the Army civilians. So it's a, it's a coming together of two um, entities and cultures, the, the Department of Defense and a federal agency. And so a lot of magic comes out of that. Um, I'd call it America's engineering firm because we don't just build for the Army uh, under military construction or on, on Army installations or Department of Defense overseas. Uh, we're also responsible for domestic water infrastructure. Uh, and what I mean by that is inland waterways, uh, including uh, best example being the Mississippi River that happens to be the waterway uh, in my command. But all the locks, dams, ports, harbors, all those things that fit under navigation, 
uh, all the um, much of the federal flood control projects were built by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and, and we also do ecosystem restoration. Uh, the, most, the biggest and most well-known example of that would be that we're partnered with the state of Florida in the restoration of the, the most amazing ecosystem uh, restoration pro pro um, project in the history of the world, which is America's Everglades. And then we also support FEMA in emergency support. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're doing that currently in Louisiana following Hurricane Ida. So because of that large domestic role, um, we can be a great tool in support of national security as well and on the international stage. And so we are authorized by Congress to provide technical advice, technical services um, in, to other countries in the world who request it and in support of combatant commands, uh, whether in emergencies or just in waterway development policy or technical um, aspects of it. I would highlight, uh, there's many examples that I could use, but I, I think the most recent example, and again, probably timely and given the other member on the panel here is to mention that I'm also, I'm dual hatted as the president of the Mississippi River Commission, which is uh, a um, congressionally authorized, was congressionally authorized in 1879 as a body that would oversee the maintenance uh, all engineering and maintenance and policy surrounding the greatest river, uh, certainly on this continent, if not the world. And so that has been, that commission has been in place since 1879. And so we are able to use that. The U.S. government is able to leverage that for other things, even outside of, uh, of the United States. And one of those things is our partnership with the Mekong River Commission, which is a body that uh, overseas, of course, as its name implies, the Mekong River. Um, and we partner with, we have a relationship th with four countries that are impacted or are part of the Mekong region, which is Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. And so sometimes where other parts of, we are, a, this is a technical relationship, this is an advisory relationship, this is a sharing of good practices, and how to best leverage major waterways and protect people and save the and protect the uh, environment as well. But of course, it's also at times this can be the only time um, outside of our defense attaches in that uh, structure for the Department of Defense to have relationships with important parts of the world on things that that are very important to them and to us. And so um, that would be one example. Um, so. Uh, anyway, a very powerful organization and um, just really awesome to be a part of it. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself. Thanks very much. And uh, I think that segue to Asia is actually a wonderful introduction for our next speaker, Admiral Hendershet, who uh, I would also add, as I, I learned just a moment ago, is, is joining us at 0130 his time. So thank you very much, sir, for, for being up for this. Oh, hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. and. Uh, uh, thanks to the Naval Institute and thanks to the Naval Academy and a special shout out to Fifth Company at the Naval Academy. Um, ironically, several of my former bosses were on earlier panels, including uh, one of my predecessors here in Beijing, uh, then Brigadier General uh, and later Lieutenant General uh, Hooper, who, uh, who mentored more than any other uh, person I can think of, mentored scores of, of military diplomats. Um, so just as a quick scene setter, this is, this is my 11th year of service uh, in, in embassies or similar settings, and about my 25th year of concentration on the PRC, um, I would argue strongly that the military has a very significant role in diplomacy, uh, whether aiding the shaping of national policies or the recognition that everyone abroad wearing a uniform is an emissary of our Navy, uh, the Department of Defense, and our nation. Um, really, I, I can give you a quick example of each one of the, uh, these lines of effort here from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Um, our first rule of law, nearly every day, myself or my office is involved in discussions or practice on the rule of law, much of it maritime centered on the South China Sea, um, and, and really always about the system under which we live in the international community, reinforcing norms and practices uh, uh, that advance uh, U.S. interests overseas. 
Uh, your second uh, topic is that of humanitarian assistance. Again, um, when serving here as the Assistant Naval Attaché in 2008 under uh, Lieutenant General Hooper, um, there was an earthquake in 2008 in Wenchuan and Sichuan province, uh, killed about 69,000 people. And almost immediately following the earthquake, members of the Defense Attaché Office flew to Chengdu and started to coordinate uh, the, the, the delivery of Department of Defense uh, state and private relief supplies to the citizens of uh, Sichuan province. And then lastly, on the topic of peacetime presence, many of our seniors in the Department of Defense contextualize uh, kind of a bumper sticker of you, you can't surge trust. You know, when we need to have relationships uh, overseas, it's too late to start building those relationships when, when we need them. So uh, folks in, in my line of work as attaches all over the world in, in nearly every uh, diplomatic mission, um, and, and frankly for nearly two centuries have been a peacetime presence that builds uh, context, depth, and insight into friends, adversaries, and critical issues which involve uh, the U.S. military, Department of Defense, uh, Department of State, and, and really uh, help significantly impact uh, our foreign policy. And with that, I'll close and uh, look forward to uh, joining, uh, joining the roundtable. Thanks very much, sir. Mr. Khan, if I could ask you to, to introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your experience in this area. Definitely. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to be here to, uh, to introduce myself. My name is uh, Mohammed Ayaz Khan, um, uh, born and raised in Afghanistan, uh, lived in the, uh, through the war, Soviet invasion, through the tough situation uh, and the Taliban's role in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, I have worked with the US military, especially with the uh, PRT from 2004 um, up to 2009 in host, host PRT, and I have worked with uh, other U.S. military agencies from 2010 to 2015 in RC South. Yes, sir. Excellent. Yes, sir. I, I'm particularly grateful to have your perspective because it's easy, as we discuss from the perspective of the military, the impact that we're hoping to have on the countries with whom we're working without considering the perspective of the countries with whom we're working. And to have your view on that is extraordinarily valuable, and I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. I'll turn next to your shipmate, Captain Adams. Um, I'm Dave Adams, uh, Captain Dave Adams. I uh, wanted to thank the Naval Institute uh, for asking me to stand in uh, today for fir the first sergeant. Uh, my dad was a sergeant major, so I'm no replacement for the first sergeant. Um, I really you know, want to hear Isa's views, I think, uh, you know, he certainly shaped my experience in Afghanistan and all the things that, that happened in Afghanistan. And uh, also talk about the South China Sea, uh, where I served as a commander's action group lead for, for Admiral Swift and Admiral Thomas as a Seventh Fleet commander. Uh, but I'll give one quick vignette, uh, and then, then I'll get off the stage. Uh, when I was early in Afghanistan, uh, we pushed out our, of our forward operating bases and we're working on, we had a little money to build diversion dams. These were dams where water would flood and the, and the water would go into the farming land. So we had money to do that. So on Isa's advice, we started pushing out into the tribes and the districts in order to build these. And uh, we went down uh, on the border of Afghanistan. We're in Coast Province, the exact base where, uh, you know, Secretary Panetta was talking about that that explosion happened uh, later. We're 154 kilometers southeast of Kabul. We're on the border. You know, Miram Shah is very close, which is the home of, uh, of uh, you know, Siraj Haqqani, the current Minister of Interior. Uh, so we get out there and we're trying to convince the tribe. Uh, you know, it's a long shura. We have the governor, we have a lot of people there uh, to accept this diversion dam. And, and the Afghans are very strong and very straightforward. They said, well, when you wanted the Russians out, you did all kinds of things. You've been here five years, you haven't done anything. And I convinced them that, hey, we are going to change that. We're going to build these diversion dams. And I was interpreting the whole time. And, and the governor was very helpful. And so they accepted the dam. And this is on the border, the Tanai tribe. And they said, hey, they would secure the border. And we could have a partnership together. And uh, we were feeling good. And we convoyed back to Bob Chapman. And uh, within a few minutes, the special operators and the, uh, and the agency was there. And they were like, um, is this your convoy? And they had a satellite photo of the convoy on the border. Um, and I'm like, yeah. And they said, well, you're in Taliban country. And I said, well, we had a great share with the tribe. We're developing relationships. And, uh, and they told me, hey, there's a Taliban commander in that village. His name is Juwal. Can you guys get some intelligence on this guy? So 
you know, of course, we were liquored up. We sent another convoy down there, got the, uh, some intelligence, took pictures of his compound, came back. So, and then, uh, you know, the special forces told us, hey, this is great. We're going to go in tonight. We're going to get this guy. You know, and uh, night raid, go get the guy. And Eyes had told me about the devastating effects of many of the night raids that were going on in coast. And I said, look, give us some time between you and us. You know, we have a deal. They're going to secure the province. And uh, they said no. But we had the good fortune to call Colonel Schweitzer, who was my boss, who called General Votel, who went uh, up. And we got it stopped for a week. Uh, I said, give me all the evidence. We went down. We held another share with the governor. We asked him to turn over Jawal to the police, which they did. Um, he went to Bagram to be interrogated, came back in three days, and we didn't lose the tribe because that night, night raid would have lost the tribe. So in this one vignette, you saw all of these things. You saw rule of law with the police. You saw diplomacy. You saw humanitarian operations with the diversion dam we were building. You saw negotiations. Uh, so that's what the guys on the ground have been doing for 20 years in Afghanistan. And we didn't do any more night raids for about nine months in coast, and it was a big part of you saw counterterrorism and military operations working together to figure this out. And, uh, you know, they called it the Coast Miracle. Um, it was because of the whole entire team, the Afghans, the PRT, the security forces under Scott Custer. Um, everybody started coming by the end. Built uh, 52 schools, including 27 girls' schools. Uh, there was only 10 or 11 kilometers of paved road in the district. Before we left, there was 100. Um, so it was a, and, you know, Secretary Gates came. Um, it was a little before Secretary Panetta's time. And we got a couple lines of in his book, and this was the model of how to do uh, counterinsurgency. So we're very proud of that time, despite uh, some stuff we'll talk about later that's happened that's sort of taken some of the, the varnish off of the great things that happened there. And then I'll just end with, if you think that there's a bifurcation between diplomacy, humanitarian assistance, diplom dem diplomacy, and hardcore warfare in the military, then you're setting us up, especially you young midshipmen who are watching, uh, for more failure. All of these things must be integrated in a real-time way. They can't be prioritized. You can't prioritize hard war fighting against diplomacy. It all has to be mixed together. Victory is war is politics, if you really believe that. Victory is political. Political requires the use of force, deterrence, and all these other things. Every, every officer needs to be a diplomat. Every enlisted person needs to be a diplomat. And uh, the highest levels need to really understand it. And we'll talk about it more, but you know, we used to be worried about the strategic corporal. The strategic corporals and sergeants didn't lose this war. It was lost somewhere else, and we can talk about that. Thank you. So that's actually a, a great lead-in, because I, I'd like to start out by perhaps playing devil's advocate a little bit. Secretary Panetta outlined a daunting array of military challenges. The continued threat of terrorism, Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. While he didn't mention it, the fact that the technological and qualitative edge U.S. forces have enjoyed for 20 or 30 years is beginning to erode as other countries catch up in the technological development, posing a greater risk to conventional warfighting tasks. The importance of diplomacy has been made clear in the course of the discussions here. But the question remains open whether this is something with military value. The national defense strategy, the national military strategy talk extensively about lethality. How do we quantify the military value of these types of non-lethal operations, these questions of presence, of promotion of rule of law, of disaster response, humanitarian assistance? Should these be primary missions for the Department of Defense, or are these lesser included cases that are done with forces that are otherwise present for war fighting or deterrent functions? And is DOD the right organization to be doing this, or should we follow the advice of ambassador, uh, the ambassadors and of Admiral Harris and increase the budget of the Department of State in order to be able to execute these functions and have DOD fun focus on warfighting functions? And Admiral, I may, may begin with you, if I could. I, uh, I think, excellent question. Um, I think the, one of the, the misnomers is that um, uh, the, the question is a bit of a misnomer because I think in many cases, if the U.S. Uh, military doesn't do this, if, if we are not responding to natural disasters, humanitarian assistance, who will do it? And I, I would suggest, and, and I think I'll do this um, for my State Department colleagues here in the embassy, that um, 
the, the, the Department of Defense is not the, the primary uh, uh, responder. I think that the first people on the scene inevitably will be our diplomats, whether they're military diplomats or foreign service diplomats, who are able to set the conditions for, uh, to use our terminology uh, in the military, to, for follow on forces, which are likely the use of Department of Defense resources to logistically uh, uh, leverage our, our capabilities and provide relief. But, you know, the um, United States Agency for International Development, Department of State, those are the, 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 real, uh, um, the real folks that have the relationships and the knowledge on the ground to uh, be the initial responders and are able to tell DOD what's needed and specifically be able to, to um, look or turn to DOD for help moving uh, relief supplies. In, you know, my personal example, when I referenced the 2008 earthquake, um, there's no way that uh, without DOD resources, without C-17s to bring uh, supplies into Chengdu, um, nobody else can do that like DOD can. And I think that um, we confuse things by, by pretending this is a primary mission. First and foremost, DOD's primary mission uh, uh, is and always will be uh, hopefully uh, war fighting. But the ability to uh, translate uh, our war fighting capability, our, our, um, our logistics capability in war fighting to leverage uh, and, uh, and provide aid, you know, there's, there's a soft power that's it's very difficult to metric. But when, when the, the doors on a C-17 open up and there's an American flag on relief supplies, very few countries can move things as fast and as efficiently as the United States. And when a country sees, um, sees that arrive, it's a pretty significant impact. And I think here, here in the PRC, that's a, a particular interest because let's face it, our, our relationship is not always smooth. Uh, during that period in 2008, we were in a period of uh, a bit of a contentious engagement with the, the, the PRC, but the people of the United States, relief uh, and comfort and supplies are not po political. We, we don't decide whether, whether to provide that based on the status of the military relationship or the political relationship. As Americans, we don't like to see people suffer. We view this as our duty as Americans and in DOD to help and, uh, you know, I think, I think that's uh, kind of the standard that we should continue. Thanks. General, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's, it is, uh, it's a great question about metrics. How do we measure it? And uh, I don't have a great answer to that, but I will um, absolutely um, tag on to something the Admiral said. It's, um, some of the things that need to be done can only be done with DOD support, whether in peacetime or in conflict. Uh, from the perspective of, of where I sit in my, my current capacity um, or in my time in the Corps, are some of our activities in Central and South America um, where we are built because the Corps is available to provide this engineering expertise uh, that really we we really don't have many peers in what we can peers worldwide and what we can do, and if we don't respond, then others will, and uh, and they are, and they're doing so quietly, and over time, though peacetime and maybe it's not on the on the radar and people aren't paying attention, uh, others are gaining access through enabling infrastructure, investing in infrastructure, providing technical expertise. And so uh, it's, it's so important that, that we are able to get in, to do the work for the good of the relationship, but also do, do it in the, uh, to help with our national security and ensuring our access should we need it. What we do find though, is we have enormous capability that we can bring to bear uh, OCONUS outside of the continental United States but that the budget to support it under the authorities that, we're, um, that we would use to operate in another country towards in these relationships is very limited and it runs out really fast. And so the core where we are positioned around the world, uh, Central America, South America, other places, uh, the, the staff is so lean and year to year, it's a question of whether we can maintain those offices because the funding just isn't there to support uh, more robust capability. We see 
day in and day out the, the ways we can help, but we are, are very limited. And so um, I think uh, it would be, you know, of course, very help, more money for everybody. Of course, everybody advocates for that, but uh, that is something we see where we know we have the capacity and the desire and the contractors and um, expertise in these different countries, but the money just isn't there to support the mission beyond a very small skeleton crew. Mr. Khan, I'm, I'm curious, being embedded with the PRT, to what extent did it influence the effectiveness that this had a military flavor as it was working? Would this have been more or less effective had it had a principally civilian flavor? Um, Having the military involved in um, in such capacity in, in cases of uh, disaster, in cases of uh, um, emergencies, um, in my personal view, uh, the, the the military um, um, effectiveness was, uh, was extraordinary. Um, um, having the capacity, having the equipment, having the personnel, uh, and especially when um, teams like PRTs that are embedded um, at a provincial and district level, um, the, um, the, the relationship that they have already, the understanding that they have uh, of the area, um, uh, in, in my personal view, it was, when you look at effectiveness, it was far way effective than any other agency um, implementing it as far as implementation goes. Uh, now, as far as uh, um, uh, flavor goes, um, uh, the, the local knows, the local will see it, the local will see the flag. Um, and they'll remember uh, the, the, f the favor, they'll remember the good intention out there. Um, they, 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 they won't, they won't um, differentiate civilians, non-civilians, but um, who, who delivered the, 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 the good deed? Um, the Americans, the flag. And they'll, they'll remember the, the human side of it, the kind side of the country. So in my opinion, the military's capacity is, is, um, is great, it's great. It's great to have them. Excellent. Captain Adams, you were a career submarine officer, if I recall, before you found yourself in command of a PRT, so it was reasonably natural that you were taking this training in acoustics, nuclear propulsion, and found yourself building dams in Afghanistan. Was, was this a good fit for you? Was this the right use? Well, my, my father had done two tours in Vietnam, so I spent some time studying counterinsurgency. Um, um, I'd always written articles and, and talked about things, but uh, um, I really believed in the mission uh, was the reason. Uh, uh, when Admiral Mullen selected me to go to Afghanistan, I was his speechwriter at the time, selected me to go to Afghanistan. I picked Coast because that's one of the places that submarines had targeted and tried to uh, kill Osama bin Laden uh, previously. Um, so I picked it on purpose. Um, you know, I believe the keys to Afghanistan are host and Kandahar and Kabul. So watching those and that history was very important. So yeah, from the deep to the desert, um, I know commanding a submarine was my dream job, but I, I lived my life in coast. That's a little diminished now because of the suffering that's going on. But um, in regards to the question, I would just tell you, and again, I'm on the other side of this, um, I don't have any question that our military can hedge against high-end warfare and fight and win that war. But I think that there are significant questions on whether we can combine all the elements of the things we're talking about today in order to consolidate, even conceive that victory. You know, without Eisenhower's diplomatic skills, could we have really handled what went on in, in, in Africa or with all of the allies? Uh, without a good plan to re rebuild Japan and, and, and Germany, would we have been able to do that? Uh, an understanding of presence. Everywhere we've won, we've been there for a very long time, which requires you to be doing things other than combat operations. Uh, so. I just think it's very important that we understand how these things fit in and master them, because we've mastered conventional warfare in the past, and I would argue even now anybody would have a tough time beating us in a conventional fight. But we've lost a lot of wars due to our ineptness at these other tools. 
So this raises the question of where these activities fit in our strategic competition. Certainly the question of competition with China has been in the background of many of the discussions so far today. Uh, again, Secretary Panetta brought to the fore the question of competition with Russia. And as the ambassadors alluded to, China has invested significant resources in these sorts of soft power activities, including in Afghanistan with infrastructure projects as well as in other places around the world. And Mr. Khan, I may, I may start with you and ask how is that perceived in Afghanistan when you have these efforts coming? Is this perceived as a competition between countries? Are you caught in the middle? Are you grateful for the assistance that's received? What, what is the perception when you look at great powers jockeying for influence through these sorts of activities? From, from an Afghan, uh, from, an, from a local perspective, um, um, the needs are there. The people are in great need of those assistance, for example, school. Um, a remote area in Afghanistan needs a school. There is no school. The people uh, cannot send their children to school. People are growing up without education. They need a school. Um, whoever can provide that is a, a priority for the people, uh, for the very, very local level. Um, and uh, Afghanistan, a country like Afghanistan, uh, a third world country, a poor country where uh, education is primarily in the cities. It was in the past. Right now, in, in the last 20 years, there was a big push to, to uh, expand it out to the outskirt areas. Um, um, the system in, in, in Afghanistan was, is centralism. Everything is in the center. Everything is at the capital level, Kabul. Then it gets to the provincial level, which is the main cities. But people actually live in the remote areas, in the villages. And their needs are not, you know, based on whatever capacity ha has been there in the past, has not been made. So people don't really um, differentiate who is providing it. They don't see that competition. Um, but whenever um, their needs are met, they appreciate it. They greatly appreciate it. And uh, uh, they see the impacts of the last 20 years, especially the, the aids from the United States uh, in implementing them. They see their results, and they greatly appreciate them. Uh, we have, I was just giving an example of schools of education. And there is a lot of educated, young educated people right now uh, it is because of uh, the push. Um, again, they they don't they don't they don't differentiate. They don't. It's not very important for them who is doing it. But as long as they get them, they appreciate it. Excellent, General Holland. I, I know that you commanded engineers in Afghanistan, and I'm curious. Did you conceive of that in the context of great power competition? And, and do you conceive of the overseas activities that the Corps of Engineers undertakes in that way? You know, um, I think we were mindful, at least I was mindful of Mr. what Mr. Khan is talking about. You know, there's, there's such a deep desire to help. Our soldiers join the Army because they want to be, they want to do things like that, that help others and bring capability. And, and um, it, so I think we were mindful of both, of, of two things, one that if we didn't do it, somebody else was going to do it. Um, but also, but probably more so, you know, the, the knowing that you can deliver what um, few others can to help the Afghan people and ultimately believing that that was going to help if we're a team. So if uh, we're successful with the Afghans and we're successful um, in our national security as well. Um, but there was, I think, uh, always a friction of this, um, and I think I think a little bit what I'm talking about that did lead to lead to an expansion of of the goals and objectives. You know, going from what we were perhaps originally envisioned ourselves doing in Afghanistan 
then led to, well, we can do all these other things, uh, which then naturally led to, well, we can also go after some of these other objectives. But um, I, I, we had very good relationships with the Afghan army, with the Afghan police, with the communities that we helped. But I think we were aware that it was who was delivering um, and that could change uh, with an administration or with a change of goals or, and just a change in the national security environment. So um, it was very rewarding and uh, very proud, you know, just like I think everybody would say if they served there. I'm very proud of the three tours that I spent there uh, in different stages of the, of the uh, campaign. Um, and hard to see what has gone on since, but very proud of what we've done. And we do believe, I think, that we made a big difference and it will pay its, we will see the benefits of that in other ways, which just uh, time will tell. So Captain Adams, you were on the, the other end, not on the receiving end, but on the administration end. And how did you perceive this when you were leading the PRT in terms of the role there? Well, I think the point that too many people miss is that, um, External influence in Afghanistan, I believe, is the single most driving factor. Um, and now we're seeing Russia and China and, and Iran uh, do that. But the single most um, force in Afghanistan is Pakistan. And the only effective insurgency, in my opinion, was the Akani Network. We can call that the Taliban. But um, as Admiral Mullen put very clearly to Congress in 2011, the Akani Network is a veritable arm of the Pakistani ISI. Um, China is now supporting Pakistan in, in their takeover of Afghanistan because they want to secure the minerals. So yes, it's that strategic competition below the level of great power and below the level of high conventional warfare where we're getting our tails kicked. And so the architects of this atrocity, which is Afghanistan, are the Pakistani forces, especially the ISI, the Wahhabi funding that's being poured into the country right now. Um, anyone who believes that we defeated the Taliban in about six weeks in 2001, the tribes turned based on where the things were going. Anybody believes that the Taliban took over those northern territories in particular that never fell to the Taliban. They bought them off first, they got them under control. So the architects of this are, are, the, are the Pakistani ISI funded by the Wahhabis. So it, that's the strategic competition that matters. And we didn't follow our own counterinsurgency manual by forcing them to be involved in these negotiations. We've never held them accountable. And the strategic collapse in Afghanistan is on us for our strategic failure. And it's on us for allowing Pakistan to do this again to the Afghan people. They want to keep Afghanistan poor and dumb as a border. They've done it in Kashmir, and they've done it in Afghanistan since the beginning of time. Emil Hendershet, you're on the front lines of strategic competition in a way that is uh, unique among our panelists, and your experience extensively serving in attache billets has given you a remarkable perspective on this. I'm curious to your thoughts. Yeah, I think um, I have a bit of a different perspective, and, and um, I think here uh, in, a, in a very large diplomatic community, a very large attache community, we're acti interacting with representatives, senior representatives from, from nearly every country uh, uh, on, on Earth uh, and observing their interactions with the People's Republic. Uh, I think one of the universal issues we, we shouldn't give short shrift to is that um, without question, the United States remains a partner of choice remains a preferred partner of choice. Um, and there's largely a perspective that the um, United States is a friend not just when the United States needs something, but also when, when, um, when another country needs something. So in, in, uh, in, as we watch uh, great power competition or strategic competition and watch how different nations yield soft power, um, I would argue the U.S. behaves very differently uh, in the fact that we are there when times are good and there when times are tough, usually. And um, we, people want to, to partner uh, with the United States, whether it's schools, training, uh, whether it's HADR projects, whether it's uh, understanding the environment. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work right now is to help countries understand what's happening in, in uh, different domains in, in their neighborhood. Uh, I, I really think we, 
we shouldn't underestimate how important uh, a United States friendship is. And, and I think particularly, I would argue over the last two years, um, when as COVID spread around the world, um, the, the behavior of various countries was quite stark and, and how the U.S. provides relief supplies, how the U.S. provides uh, COVID vaccinations and how uh, some other countries provide relief and provide vaccinations with significant conditions attached. And as I alluded to earlier uh, in 2008, um, the United States continues to do things because that's who we are and we live uh, we, we live Americanism around the world. We don't like to see people suffering. We, we believe that um, even if we have political differences, uh, we can do something to, to prevent uh, suffering and to help people. We seem to be suffering a brief uh, interruption of connection there to Beijing. Hopefully, Abel Hindushet will be able to rejoin us here momentarily. If, if I can jump in um, while, we, while we wait for the Admiral, um, I, you know, I would totally agree, and I don't pretend to be an expert. Uh, I'm not uh, a foreign area of, officer, and I'm and, uh, not an intel analyst or anything, but uh, that has absolutely been my experience uh, around the world that I've been, Central, South America, Africa, Asia, uh, that we the U.S. is the partner of choice, and it's for some reasons that the Admiral highlighted, but it's also some just very practical reasons uh, from the engineering uh, side of it, the technology that we bring, the quality of construction with an eye for safety and longevity and life cycle maintenance and all of those things. We deliver everywhere where we construct, we oversee contractors doing construction, is superior to what any of our competitors can do. Um, and when we don't do it right, we then, we admit it and we come in and, and correct it. And my, in my, any of these engagements, that has been the feedback that they would all much prefer that we are ready and available to support with uh, a whole host of, um, of uh, functional areas, uh, just if, both for practical purpose, purposes, but for all the, many of the other ideals that we stand for. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Hodges, I think I think uh, I dropped off for, for a moment. Um, occasionally, uh, um, internet service can be a bit spotty, but I think one of the other points to to uh, pile on to the, the general's comment is when we look at an organization like the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, the history and 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 the understanding of how we do systems programming. When, when a partner buys a capability from the United States or when we, when we uh, provide that capability, unlike many countries, we, we provide a cradle to grave uh, support. So we provide training. We can tell a partner in the life cycle of this system, these are the uh, parts that will need to be replaced. This is pe how periodically they will need to be replaced. And a lot, a lot of people um, partnering with new countries in security cooperation, um, uh, weapon sales, uh, for example, tend to find out that you're, you don't really know what you've bought until you've been given multiple bills on the back end. That um, when, a, when a partner partners with the United States, when they buy from us, they, they really understand and we can tell them what the life cycle will um, statistically look like. Um, in many of my interactions with, with uh, friends here, uh, some people find out that they, what they thought they bought is not exactly what they bought and learn later that uh, they may have purchased a cheaper item up front that becomes more expensive over the life cycle with uh, unknown and unplanned for uh, maintenance and replacements that uh, were, were at best uh, hidden in, in the bottom line price tag. Yeah, and I, I think especially in the context of China's Belt and Road Initiative, these sorts of considerations are, are important in the lessons of the debt trap diplomacy as we've seen with Sri Lanka and the ability of the United States to be a good faith partner in the work that's done there is, is something that's very important. 
I want to ask one brief last round of questions from my chair, but I would, while I'm doing that, I would invite the members of the audience to please come up. The microphone is up above the seating section there, and if you have questions, we very much want to get to the questions from the audience. But uh, bef while the audience is getting together there, an area that I would like to discuss is the question of the civil-military relations that are involved in these types of activities, because it often involves unconventional chains of command. General Hooper mentioned the fact that attaches have about 10 bosses. Um, and, you know, Captain Adams, when, when you were working with the PRT, you had a variety of different agencies working with you. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment briefly on what were the civil military concerns that, that you had in, in that context? In the context of the chain of command? Of, of just working with the PRTs and, and the assembly of agencies that were brought together. Uh, it was a very great challenge. Uh, both the internal challenges of working with the different uh, building relationships among the special forces, the other government agencies, the State Department, USAID, Department of Agriculture, and then going out and working with the different Afghan groups from the tribes to the teachers, uh, to the Minister of Education, to, uh, to the folks in Kabul. So it was a very complex array of uh, relationships you had to build, the most difficult I've ever, I've ever dealt with. But if you built them and they really worked, then you were able to accomplish things. So, yeah, very, very difficult, you know, and uh, you have to have many different bosses and many different, um, you know, we tried as best we could to keep a streamlined chain of command, but, you know, um, we would say our day never survived contact with the governor. You know, we'd have our plan, then we'd go see the governor, and he'd say, well, we got to go do a sure with this tribe, so we'd be adjusting the plan. And uh, very, very uh, difficult to manage all those relationships. But I would say if, if, if you can master that skill, uh, then it's very important, and again, Related to the whole thing, you know, a military uh, member who's not a diplomat, uh, you cannot win. You cannot win with just warheads on foreheads. It will, it will not work. Mr. Khan, I'm, I'm curious what this looked like from your perspective. How did you perceive the relationship between the military and the civilian agencies that were involved in running the PRT and conducting that mission? Um, when, from my perspective, working as an advisor, uh, as an interpreter, um, uh, our direct uh, supervisors were the military. But of course, we had uh, the civilians, the State Department, the USAID, um, and agriculture um, departments. Um, it, 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 you have to, like uh, the captain earlier said, you have to. Um, you have to manage them. It takes extra energy to, to, to manage it because they come from different perspective, uh, from different concern for the military. It's very important to um, make sure everybody is safe and secure. For the civilian, they don't think too much of that. They think of more of the mission, more of the, you know, the relationship that they would like to build or more whatever they want to get. Um, it is a balance, and um, it takes extra energy to keep that balance, but um, um, once, once you establish it, it works. It works. Admiral Hendershed, I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this, especially in the interactions with Chinese military that have a very different model of civil military relations. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's an understatement. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if my former boss, uh, General Hooper, is still there, but you alluded to the fact that um, as attaches, we have to be quite comfortable in the ambiguity of our chain of command. And uh, as, a, as a young uh, lieutenant commander and commander watching uh, General Hooper, um, you quickly need to become comfortable with having more bosses than uh, probably most people in DOD are comfortable with. But ultimately, um, in peacetime, the ambassador in every country is ultimately responsible and remember that the ambassador is the president's personal representative in each of those countries. The ambassador is responsible for the synchronization of U.S. government efforts um, uh, in, in our relationships with that country. So while there, we have lots of bosses, at the end of the day, the ambassador is the president's representative and, and is, is the uh, word on, on, on the ground. And I think that um, the skill set for us that's most helpful is being comfortable in that ambiguity um, and being able to action people's requests and demands 
such that they understand that you perceive they are uh, important and they are the boss and to make sure we're we're moving um, all efforts uh, in the same direction in support of uh, national objectives and uh, and the ambassadors. So, General Holland, you have perhaps uh, one. It, of, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Admiral. I was just going to say, you know, that here, as you uh, rightly alluded, um, uh, it's a very different system to watch uh, our hosts with um, with a military that, frankly, is is far more empowered than the military in our own. Um, in our own system and the PLA is is almost a, uh, a branch of government here in the PRC. So, thank you. General Holland, you know, your civil military challenges are unique, I think, among many of the military folks because of the routine interaction that you have with state and local governments. And while we're all accultured to the idea that the U.S. military is an apolitical organization or at least free of partisan dispute, the size of the contracts that the Army Corps of Engineers inevitably have partisan implications for the, the questions that come up. How do you navigate these civil military questions and, and how do you perceive them in the context of this sort of diplomatic and military balance? And that's a great question. This has really been, um, and I've only been the, in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers since 2017. Uh, this has really been my first experience where I am so immersed in the political environment and have to be, I mean, we're all supposed to be mindful of politics and, and be uh, apolitical and, and all of that. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, because of what you described, but more so because we are funded directly from Congress for the Civil Works program, the water infrastructure, which is very big money uh, with very big implications. Um, every congressman believes they own their district commander, and that's a colonel out there, 05 or 06, that works in their state. Um, and, and I, you know, my, the colonels that work in those positions are speaking more often with congressmen and senators than most general officers in the Army ever will. Um, and so um, I do a lot of that. And so that takes a lot of self-discipline, that takes um, a lot of soft skills. Uh, I think m by and large our elected officials respect the fact that we're supposed to be apolitical. I think that's one of the great advantages that we have as a federal agency, that we are also apolitical, can't take sides in our opinion or our um, approach and um, our executing a program and, and completing a project does not change with an administration or a change of party uh, because of our link to DOD. And so I think that's uh, one of its great strengths. You know, beyond that to the, to the issue of multiple bosses, it's really been a long time since I had a single boss. I mean, technically I, ha I will always have a single boss, but uh, really at a very, uh, pretty junior level already had to be flexible and adaptable and take a lot of guidance from a lot of different entities, uh, other partners, federal partners, um, other services, uh, ultimately understanding that you, are, you do legally answer to one, but I think just being a leader, being a uniform person in today's environment requires the, an outlook of, you know, I'm, it's a team of teams. Uh, I've got to execute, learn, be comfortable in the gray, in gray areas, um, be a listener, all those soft skills. Uh, I think even, and it's, I think it's really accelerated in just in my career. Maybe I didn't have to do those things until I was a major, may, maybe, uh, in 04. I would say today what I see in the Army is our lieutenants, our um, 02, 01, 02, 03 level officers have to be really, really adept at all that and very comfortable with it. So um, it's not just in the jobs that we have, but I think it's just a change in, in the military and expectations of our young leaders. Excellent. So I believe we have some questions from the audience. I see a midshipman up there. If you can please state your name and if your question is intended for one of our panelists, indicate as much. Please go ahead. Good afternoon all. <clears throat> midshipman First Class Henderson. This question is directed to anyone on the panel to ask. Um, a common theme in the conference so far has been the need for the military and the State Department, as well as various other agencies to work in conjunction to achieve national objectives. 
The military enjoys a high level of public trust and respect, but in recent years, the bureaucracy has lost trust from the American public due to attacks and efforts to discredit the bureaucracy and career government officials, often dubbed as the deep state. My question is, how can leaders in government and elected officials restore this trust in the American people so that any effort can be continuous across administrations and election cycles? It's an incredibly important question about the issue of trust and how the military does that, and, and that, again, brings those implications of ways in which the military develops trust and how that affects the relationship with the diplomatic efforts as it goes. Uh, which, which of our panelists wants to uh, provide the definitive answer to that first? And, uh, General? I guess, I, yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I, so I don't pretend to give advice to other, um, other arms of the government, uh, but I will say, as, as I mentioned, that it's, I, I find it pretty extraordinary how the Army Corps of Engineers is thrust into this political environment and has to always be mindful of, of uh, where our left and right limits are. Um, I think we, uh, and one of the reasons we are entrusted with the domestic responsibilities that we have is because um, people know that we are apolitical and that we don't have a political agenda. And, and, and when there are big challenges, we're not afraid to go out and confront them. Um, and when, when uh, folks are criticizing us, whether it's, whether it's one, of the, uh, one of our states, our cities, a non-federal sponsor for a project, uh, we get a lot, you know, so if you pay attention to the news when it, as it pertains to water infrastructure, uh, every so often we'll get a love note in the media about uh, something somebody doesn't like about us and something that we decided that we, they wish we had decided better. But we don't shy away from it. We, we engage, we collaborate, we're very transparent. We work really hard to be transparent with the what limits us, why we made the decisions uh, we made, we take a lot of public input. We will, even if we know we're going to get shouted out, uh, even if uh, you know we're going to be criticized heavily, and you know it's a, often a very uncomfortable situation uh, with local communities who really need our help. Uh, we are not. We will always go out and meet them. And sometimes we find that we're the only representative of the federal government, even though we've got many federal partners that are or state partners that that are a, a part of the team. Uh, one of the concluding comments often from the public is, at least you came to talk to us. At least you let, at least you came and you listened to us. Um, and, and that's what has worked, I think, from the core. And that's one of our foundational principles as we work through, especially in a, re a resource constrained environment, um, that people know that there's somebody out there listening and, and willing to take their questions and, and critiques. Hey, Dr. Hodges, if I, if I could also provide a comment. Um, I work here in a system which could not be more diametrically opposed to this question than, than, uh, than one would imagine. It's important for us to remember that the People's Liberation Army and all of its components are not a national military. They do not swear allegiance to China or the people of China. They are the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party and the allegiance that Chinese officers swear is to the Chinese Communist Party. Looking back on my career, my first uh, submarine wardroom, ward the rules for what we talked about and how we engage each other professionally were quite significant about what we did and did not talk about. I think the professionalism that we ingrained, frankly, uh, from midshipmen all the way through our, our flag officers about what we, about maintaining an apoliticization a of, of the force is critical. And that doesn't happen, you know, we're not expected to uh, step out of politics when we're captains. That should happen fundamentally at the junior most level. Um, the department's not asking people to not have a political opinion, but that political opinion is not supposed to be driving your actions. Unlike my hosts, which uh, it's all about the politics. In our military, it's about the Constitution, and the divorce we have from uh, a politicized military is quite healthy and quite unique, and something that we should all strive to preserve. Madam, Mr. Khan. Um, 
Please. My, no, my I would just add to that just briefly um, that uh, from a military context, and I agree with uh, the other panelist, but uh, you have to tell the truth. You have to be transparent. We may have some questions about that over the last 20 years, but not nearly as, um, as you know, the military in particular hasn't lost trust like we did after Vietnam when there was a perception that high level officials and generals were not telling the truth about the war. And I think just, just being transparent, telling the truth, and then uh, of course we have to integrate with our partners at the State Department, USAID, all the other agencies. There's an argument out here who should take on what. We have to realize our strengths and our weaknesses of each agency and try to team together in what we call a whole government approach. Sometimes I think we want to shift too much onto agencies that don't have the capability or capacity, but we have to do that. But as far as trust, and I'll be honest, I don't know how much uh, the truth is. We live in a different universe uh, with regard to the truth sometimes, but uh, I would just say for those of us, tell the truth, be transparent, and, uh, and, and then you have the best chance of building trust. I don't have much opinion about this. Uh, my, uh, my, I mean, my whole uh, career, Afghanistan, Afghanistan's issues, um, yeah, I, I don't have detailed opinion on, on this matter. That's, that's fair. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. So Thank I, you all. I'll take a, one more question from the audience first, and then we'll switch to one of the remote questions and then come back to the audience. Sir. Hello, everybody. I'm Commander Justin Dargan. I'm a Navy Foreign Area Officer, and I'm working in the CNO's uh, Security Cooperation and Passport Branch at the Pentagon. Uh, my question is for Admiral Hendershot, but really it's for everyone across the panel. Uh, you all have such a wealth of experience working in a diplomatic capacity. Uh, and I'm looking to see if you have any career advice for a mid-career professional and prospective attache like myself, or for some of the younger officers and midshipmen here today, uh, for how we can build lasting relationships and best advance U.S. security cooperation and, and partnerships abroad. Thank you. Hey, uh, great, great question. Um, <clears throat> and I think um, I think General Hooper, again, if General Hooper's there, he'd probably tell you a lot of it is luck, because there's no way General Hooper would have predicted that uh, Lieutenant Commander Hendershot would be uh, Rear Admiral Hendershot. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the partnerships that you refer to start at home, and by that, I mean that in, in our system of, uh, of joint education and, and joint employment, a lot of those relationships you make in the military as, as you're, you're building your career, uh, whether it's um, Command and General Staff College, <clears throat> the interaction you have with your, your joint partners, and hopefully more and more with your interagency partners, are really going to come, come in handy later on when you are overseas in an embassy or in a Just Mag. Um, in a security cooperation office where you can go to your Rolodex and call a friend and ask his or her advice about what, what's happening. Um, and similarly, um, that's, that's gonna come into play when you're, when you're in an embassy and working with partners. I'm, I'm continually surprised uh, when attaches are unable to make relationships within the embassy. You know, we are, um, we are chartered by our organizations to be full members of the embassy community. And as such, um, uh, I need to build relationships with uh, other attaches, with People's Liberation Army leaders, but I also need to build partnerships and relationships inside the embassy so that uh, the Department of Defense is viewed as a legitimate, uh, earnest, reliable partner in everything that the, that the mission does. So I think that my, my answer is to um, uh, don't, don't focus on what, what skills you need to build relationships once you, once you get to the embassy. Start building those relationships now and be a person who can, who can um, agree to disagree, be professional in your disagreement, um, build lasting partnerships, build friendships. Um, people that I've served with in embassies uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, I'm, I'm still friends with. So it's really all about uh, personal connections. Excellent. Any thoughts from any of the other panelists? I'm going to go to one of the questions from the uh, remote that asks, you know, we've heard from both General Holland and Admiral Hendershot that the United States is the partner of choice. And 
the question wants to push back a little bit on that and ask, can you give concrete examples? Because there's a perception, for example, that China will come in and offer assistance without the same sorts of strings attached that the United States does. They won't make assistance conditional on certain human rights conditions or issues of democratic governance. And so what are the specific cases where the United States is, in fact, the partner of choice? And, and I would add to it, how does the United States fare in that competition versus some of our competitors? Yeah, fair, fair question. Um, I can give you uh, I can give you examples, but because of the nature of, of what we're discussing, I'll keep them uh, uh, loose enough to not be um, very very specific. I, I can tell you that that partners, potential partners, will approach me and say, "We want to buy this system from the United States. We want to have this training from the United States." Um, but as I said earlier. The United States is different, and we're different for a reason, and that difference is good. Um, there are countries who uh, execute foreign policy and execute security cooperation via suitcases full of cash. That's not how we do things. There are, are rules, regulations, and laws about how this is done to ensure that we are on the up and up and that we're protecting ourselves, we're protecting uh, human rights issues. Um, those are not mutually exclusive. We can still build lasting, valuable uh, partnerships by uh, obeying, obeying the rules. I think you know, as we come to terms with a shifting a strategic competition, with a shifting worldwide strategic environment, um, as I alluded to earlier, and, and probably uh, a conversation that could occupy an entire, uh, an entire conference like this one, Behavior of certain countries over the last 18 to 24 months through COVID and through uh, various COVID uh, diplomacies has done it more to convince the rest of the world about ultimate objectives and goals than any diplomat, any PowerPoint conversation could have done. So the behavior in capitals with how they um, leveraged relief supplies, how they sold vaccines, how they um, profited on, on certain uh, uh, disaster uh, responses um, w was significant in convincing many countries around the world about what the competition uh, would likely be like in the 21st century. Mr. Mr. Khan, I'm curious, from the perspective of an Afghan citizen, was the emphasis on questions such as human rights, such as the education of girls and women, the effort to oppose corruption. First, was that an important consideration? And second, was it perceived as successful? Um, yes, uh, from, from, from an Afghan perspective, um, the, initially the partnership with the United States was, uh, was a key component. Uh, if it goes back to, uh, the history of 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, when Afghanistan back in the days was, was friends with the United States. The, the, the assistance that they received from the United States were uh, very prominent and very quality, and people still remember them and mention them. Um, and um, in the last 20 years since I have been involved, uh, we have been involved, or we have been witness of um, um, the, 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 the partnership was, was very valuable, very valued. Um, and for Afghans, yes, um, um, human rights, girls' education, boys' education, in general, um, um, live, living as other nations are closer to in the 21st century was very, very important. Uh, corruption was something that Afghans were bothered. Um, and of, of course, it had, uh, it had um, um, external and internal aspects to it. But um, no Afghan was happy about it. They, everybody was complaining. And of course, there was not a comprehensive 
approach to eliminate. Time would eliminate further education, further digitalizations of systems would help. Uh, but it was definitely a, um, a, a, a bothering element that everybody was not happy about it. So we can go to the uh, midshipman up there at the microphone. Midshipman third class, Alex Gannon. Uh, my question is for all of the panelists. Uh, how should we interact with countries at risk of Chinese economic influence, particularly in Latin America and Africa, uh, given that they could be skeptical of the intent of the United States? Oh, I'll take that a little bit first because, uh, you know, I think the Admiral did a great job of uh, pointing out. But let's be clear, these are the relationships they're building. They're not with, uh, you know, if you look at our partners compared to Chinese partners, I'll take our partners any day of the week, you know, Iran, Pakistan, uh, you know, and then their efforts in Central America and, and Africa are great, but the people I talk to there, um, it's, it's a pretty transactional, it isn't what the question said on my screen, which was that, hey, it, you know, it's viewed with no strings attached. That, that is not the perception that I get. Uh, they're, they're big time takers. We saw that in Afghanistan. They just came in, took, and left. Um, so I think we should continue to engage those countries as part of our strategy. But I think that the way that they're engaging those countries will speak for itself to those countries. Um, and, and let's just see how that plays out. Yeah, I think that's very valid. That, that I think that, um, you, you know, that there, there are a lot of questions uh, as Belton Road has developed. There were many questions about what the U.S. policy was about supporting or not supporting. What the U.S. policy has been is is uh, very much a uh, a truth in lending policy. That uh, what we are pursuing is uh, a clear um, a clear understanding of what what countries are. Um, getting and what they are, what it is costing them. I think that this is very applicable to partnerships. I think that when a country partners with the United States, and, and again, I wish that you could hear uh, comments that I hear every day about what it is like to have a U.S. partner. Um, that, you know, many, many cases, countries, there there is a certain clout, a certain, um, uh, importance to being able to be in your region and say you are a U.S. partner. You may not be uh, a U.S. ally. You may not be the top uh, uh, top uh, country in your region. Uh, but when a country can say we are a partner of the United States, that matters. It matters in the region, and it matters to those people to say we believe that the U.S. is, is a is a viable partner uh, and an important partner. Um, I think that. The um, I would flip your question a little bit and talk about the. We may have conditions that that countries need to meet to get U.S. partnership, but many alternatives to U.S. partnership. That's where the strings are attached. There's a lot of um, uh, on the backside expectations about what uh, what aid, what projects, what um, military sales eventually cost you. I think that the U.S. is very transparent in, in our partnerships. General, I'm, I'm especially curious with your experience in Latin America, what your perspective on that is. It would be exactly the same. Uh, I don't think I can top what the two gentlemen have said. Uh, word gets out. Uh, those who have had investment or uh, services performed or advice given or, or whatever, um, in their countries, uh, it's the the price tag is on the backside, and um, the some of our our friends have learned some lessons uh, that they don't want to repeat. And um, we are we are very transparent because we have to be. It's not just with our partners because we have to be transparent with our government and with the taxpayer dollars, that mean, that translates also to being trans, uh, transparent with our partners and in, in building trust. So um, I really can't say it any better than they did. Excellent. So we, we have another question from the, uh, 
virtual audience here that says, uh, does recent experience in Afghanistan provide a different perspective on social services, building schools? Um, and we, we've answered this to a bit, but the question is, should we moderate our efforts in such activities while at the same time conducting military operations? Any thoughts there? Well, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I will. Um, so um, if we're going to do nation building, we can argue about whether we're going to do it. But in the case of Afghanistan, I would remind everybody that it's the only time in history that Article 5 of the United Nations Charter has been activated, which the Security Council gave the ISAF the authority to go remove the Taliban. Ninety percent of the American people supported that effort. And as Colin Powell said, we broke it and we bought it. And so in order to do nation building, which I don't advocate except in an extreme circumstance where you have a government harboring a group which was totally integrated with that group that, that took down two cities in the skylines of New York, now you have to do it. And counterinsurgency manual, I believe, is very good, written by General Petraeus. It was three years after, after the war started and 30 years after Vietnam concluded. And it tells you what to do, and it's pretty good. It says, first thing you got to do is separate the enemy from the people. That's the security part. I would argue the security part is not as hard as people think in Afghanistan. Not a, pe a lot of people died in both of the last conversions. Afghans, you know, harass, maneuver, and negotiate. So the tribes can bring security, as I, you know, in our one year of, of hope there. So security, not as big of a problem. The only time we got in a problem is when we flooded troops in there or sent Uzbeks and Tajiks into Pashtun regions. So security is number one. And then number two, you have to connect the people to their government. In order to do that, the government has to deliver services. And so that comes to whatever you want to say, these social services. You have to help the government do that. You know, in Afghanistan, we put a lot of money in, and you'll hear a lot of numbers. But, you know, the president promised a Marshall Plan for Afghanistan, and we never delivered one. All the countries around Afghanistan have power. Afghanistan today still doesn't have power, and it will be a dumb, poor country until we develop power. That's one example. We did build roads and schools. So you have to do this. And then third, you transform the environment by ensuring that the people are looking to the government and that they have jobs. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, the only one capable of doing it in our history is the United States military. We did it not only in Germany and Japan, but we did it all over the world. Uh, you can go to, if you've ever been to Guam, what do you think of the government? You know, that was built by the United States Navy or Saipan. So we have to learn to do this. We can't moderate it. You can't win without it. it you probably can't. Uh, get the violence stopped without it, but even if you do, you can't cement your victory without a long-term presence doing these types of activities. And you, so I would love to somebody to give me a case where we did the Powell Doctrine, we fight, we win, we come home, and we get the political result we want long-term. It requires long-term presence in doing these activities. And we as a military and as a population, uh, if we don't learn how to do that, we're going to experience more Afghanistans, more Iraqs, more Vietnams, more Somalias, that whole list that Secretary Panetta, of failures that we laid out. So we have one more question from Midshipman. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Midshipman, third class, Ullman Torno. Uh, this question is for the Admiral. Sir, you said we had a duty to help those suffering. In the case of, for example, the Uyghur Muslims, where the country is refusing or not allowing humanitarian assistance, at what point should the military be used, or should the military be used at all to intervene and provide assistance? Um, this is a good question. Uh, I, I hope, um, and, and Dr. Hodges, I, I hope if you, you can pass my, this is one that I think is, is a bit, uh, will get me quickly over my skis in, in where we are uh, policy-wise. Um, uh, and I, 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 uh, I would respectfully ask, that's one I'm not comfortable addressing about what's, what's happening in Xinjiang. I can understand that. That is a, uh a particularly delicate issue for you to comment on from, from your position there. Um, I, I may take the moderator's prerogative and ask one brief question, is that so much of what we've discussed here as a wrap-up deals with credibility and personal relationships. And I'm curious if each of the panelists could comment just very briefly on how that's been affected by the recent events in Afghanistan and whether you see that as a challenge to our ability to carry out these types of missions. And, uh, Mr. Khan, I may start with you, and then we'll go around and, and wrap up with General Hall. Um, with, with, the recent, with the recent incidents and the recent uh, unfavorable um, um, what happened, uh, I, I, I think it would be 
a greater chance for us to explore, to, uh, to get into deeper details on why, we, why it failed. Uh, it was a success, a success, and all of a sudden uh, we shifted our attention and we thought some other um, um, solution may, some other idea may work, and it failed, and it failed us. I think it's very important um, for, 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 you know, for the people of America, for us to, be, to understand the truth, to, you know, to get an honest detail of, okay, why did we have to, I mean, if something was working, why did we not continue? Why did we shift it to something that is not working? So I think it will be a great learning experience, and we should, in my opinion, learn from it. Cap Adams, very briefly. Well, I think it would be um, it would be dishonest to say our credibility is not vastly impacted by what looks like a surrender when we leave the embassy and let the Taliban flag while the Chinese embassy and Pakistan embassies open. When we leave Bagram in the middle of the night and we don't even turn it over to the Afghan forces. So I think that's disgraceful for the United States, whoever you want to blame. And I think it gives a big credibility gap. But worse, worse, it gives a huge pump to the Islamic radical movement. And you know, you know, there's a great book called The Fountainhead of Jihad. And it explains how the defeat of the Soviets led to 9-11. So I would just tell you, not only has it damaged our credibility, but it's given our enemies which I believe are the most serious enemies beyond Russia and China, in case you're in It's given them fuel. And if that fountainhead led to 9-11, stand by for what our defeat in Afghanistan will mean for the American people. Thank you. Admiral, how has uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan affected your ability to uh, perform in your role? I think that our, uh, our credibility is extremely strong, frankly. And I think that, you know, as Americans and as military professionals, we are you know, we're critical of ourselves. One of the opportunities I have living in this system and hearing criticisms of our system, of the US system nearly every day, the beauty of our system is it allows criticism. It allows introspection and it allows uh, self-correction when we see what we have done and what we don't want to do again. There are other systems around the world that absolutely prohibit any type of public introspection and public guidance as to what's happening. Uh, as you know, as my hosts look at the United States over the last, uh, say, 24 months and criticize lots of issues, I am uh, I cannot help to be an optimistic American to say that. America is where it is today because of its experience, and we will be where we will be tomorrow because of our experience as well. And many of these uh, issues may be difficult at the time, but I can't help but hope and believe that they will make us a stronger nation and a stronger military for the experience and for the ability to understand what we did and why we did it and what we want to be in the future. General Holland, we'll offer you the last word, ma'am. I appreciate that. I have to uh, somewhat agree with the Admiral. Uh, certainly the situation, the recent situation in Afghanistan is a cautionary tale. It will be very important that all of our services uh, and other federal agencies look at this and look hard at ourselves and, and um, understand the lesson, the right lessons to learn from it. Um, However, I think, uh, you know, the long, what will matter is the long view of history and our reputation over time. I, I think that um, our, our relationships are strong. I think our, and our competitors tend to have a more long view of history as well. And I think um, they are not so emboldened uh, over this situation to, um, that it would completely change the tra trajectory of how they treat us or how they talk about us, but but there's no doubt we have to look hard at ourselves and and uh, teach the next generation of of military leaders, civilian leaders, what the right lessons, what the right takeaways are. Well, I, I'd like to thank each of our panelists. Uh, there's just such an incredible scope and diversity of experience and perspectives here, and this has been extraordinarily valuable for me, I, I hope for the audience members as well, to gain a better understanding of the degree to which this sort of 
fusion of diplomatic and military efforts are integral to the day-to-day -day conduct of operations. And I, I think the point that Captain Adams made and that I've heard echoed in General Holland and Admiral Hendershot is that there is not a clear distinction between the diplomatic and the military function, that this is something that is integrated into every aspect of the profession and what we do in service of the nation and that security has to be considered holistically and that if it is pursued with imbalance in either side, that it's unlikely to lead to the result that we desire. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn back over to Admiral Daly. Well, thank you. Uh, we appreciate this, uh, this panel because we heard from the practitioners, the people who really had to make things happen and are currently making things happen um, every day. Uh, that's, a, that's an important group of people to hear from, and uh, this has been terrific. And again, we thank, on behalf of our Naval Academy audience, all who are here, the U.S. Naval Institute, we thank Major General Holland, we thank Rear Admiral Hendershed, we thank Mr. Khan, we thank Captain Dave Adams, USN retired, and our moderator, Bill Hodges, for a terrific panel. Let's give them a huge hand. I'd also just like to say that uh, we have a gift for each of our panel members. Again, the two Naval Institute books, Quiet Cadence and the Herndon Climb. Um, I'll do that afterwards and send it to our remote participants. A special shout out to uh, Admiral Hendershed for uh, joining us between 0130 and 0300 Beijing time. That's uh, pretty awesome. And uh, I want to thank the Wood Foundation once again for their generous sponsorship which makes this entire series on uh, applied history possible. This is our 10th year of doing this with the Naval Academy, our 11th year overall with the sponsorship from the Wood Foundation, and we thank them. We thank our audience in person and our large remote audience, and this concludes our conference from today. for today. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, very sir. much.